It's a pleasure to be here, especially where there's utterly so many animal behavior people, which is awesome. Uh, so the topic I want to talk to you about today are the architectural foundations of collective behavior, and particularly the social dynamics uh, that happen within nature's housing market. So obviously, this gentleman, Charles Darwin, laid the foundation for our understanding of evolutionary biology. If you fast forward about a century later, uh, Richard Dawkins um, summarized a lot of that knowledge in his book, The Selfish Gene, where he posits that you and I are lumbering robots blindly programmed by our genetic material. Uh, increasingly, our understanding of evolution allows us to think of organisms as playing some active role. And this comes from a number of different lines, from work on niche construction, to work on animal architecture, to a really lovely recent interdisciplinary uh, article on how architecture can impact collective dynamics. Uh, and it, it hasn't escaped me that in uh, the building of this new building that probably the architects considered some meta level of architecture impacting people who study collective behavior. Uh, and hopefully they designed it in a way that will facilitate that maximally. Uh, so embodying all of these different uh, concepts, I'd like to just step back and actually take a quote from a movie, which is one that I like. It's The Departed, uh, which is surprisingly the only movie for which Martin Scorsese won the Academy Award for Best Director. Uh, and this movie is actually set in um, Boston, uh, near where Dartmouth is. And uh, at the very beginning of the movie, there's a great quote by Jack Nicholson that I think aptly summarizes um, one of the central concepts of this talk. So there you have it. Uh, if, you, uh, if you couldn't hear it, I will do my best Jack Nicholson impression, which is, I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. And so if you think about this, this is really interesting because um, it provides a different way to reach adaptive fit between organism and environment. And so if you think about how natural selection works, it starts with a diverse array of phenotypes, those organisms in red your environment in green with these beautiful PowerPoint pictures. Natural selection comes in and winnows it down to only those organisms that fit the environment. Yet, organisms can also encounter environments to which they don't fit, and they can change that world through construction and architecture, and therefore also reach adaptive fit. Um, now, Darwin himself was very aware of this. Uh, after The Origin of Species, he published another book, which Perhaps because of the title, uh, this was not given as much recognition, but his book, The Formation of Vegetable Mold by the Action of Worms, was indeed exactly on this topic. Now, what's most profound about this construction that earthworms and many other organisms do is that not just that you can reach adaptive fit, but what happens after that organism dies. And after that organism dies, you're left with a modified environment that can be substantially different from the original environment. And what's most important from the perspective of evolution is that if that lasts, that can transform selection pressures on later generations. And it's this that I'd like to look at, is how this architecture can ultimately impact these social dynamics in later generations. Um, I've worked on a number of systems across the years from very initially starting on ants um, all the way to primates. But what I'd like to talk to you about in this talk is a particular system that I've fallen in love with. And uh, these animals are hermit crabs. And you might say, why do I want to hear about them? Well, William Beebe, uh, an early explorer and naturalist, noted that if we live out our span of life on the Earth without ever knowing a crab intimately, we have missed having a jolly friendship. And I'll suggest that these hermit crabs can be a jolly good friend to us as behavioral ecologists. And the ones I'd like to look at are in particular are these social hermits, um, which through a process um, that I'll detail, through architecturally remodeling shells, they've come together to form social groups. So these animals, they ultimately have very low relatedness. That arises because they cast their larval offspring into the ocean, those float vast distances. But once those return to land, where they spend the entire rest of their lives after that larval phase, is they form these very interesting groupings, which I'll go into detail about. And within these groupings, there's interesting forms of social coordination and also forms of cooperation among non-kin, where individuals will work together to evict others. And all of this ultimately seems to link to this very simple change in architecture. So as kind of the overarching uh, background for this, uh, you can think of it like follows. So these animals change shells, and I'm going to show you how they do that. They construct them, 
they alter the inner architecture, and this is a very costly process. And in the midst of these shells being remodeled and many of them accumulating, there's been a new decision point where individuals, instead of remodeling themselves, they can basically wait until a conspecific dies or critically is evicted, and they can form, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, these very interesting social groupings around that. Um, so to put this in perspective in a phylogenetic uh, context, these hermit crabs, there's actually almost a thousand worldwide distributed from the tropics to the Arctic. And I just want to show you how special these species are that do this remodeling because um, among all of these thousand, it's only about 20, these terrestrial crabs that do this. And so uh, we study all of these animals. They're unified by this peculiar aspect of their biology where they require this external form of protection. They have a very dainty little abdomen and they carry around a shell. Um, so the marine crabs uh, we work on at a, at a local uh, marine site, which is called Shoals Marine Laboratory, which I have like a little lesson there, which uh, this is our first paper from Shoals Marine Laboratory. Be aware when donors are coming to your field site because uh, by chance, and having only published one paper from this field site, we had a gentleman who's a Dartmouth alum donate a million dollars to support our continued research there, just because he thought it was cool that we were going out in wetsuits studying hermit crabs. <laughs> so keep that in mind whenever you're doing your research. Uh, we also have another project that's only just recently started that is on uh, these animals, coconut crabs, which are the largest terrestrial invertebrate. And this is work in the Chagos Archipelago, where uh, on many of these islands, humans haven't stepped foot for the past half century. Uh, and this work has been funded by uh, multiple grants from National Geographic. And just uh, so I have a little present for Ian, this is a t-shirt that one of my students designed that has a coconut crab on there. And so I only expect that I'll get a Max Planck t-shirt um, in exchange <laughs> at some point. Uh, so the species I want to talk about today, though, um, are these terrestrial hermit crabs, Cenobita compressus in particular. And this has been a long-term project. I didn't think that was going to happen when I first went down there. I, had started this as a small side project at the end of my PhD, and it's now turned into a decade-long project. And I'm very thankful for Ian for, during one year, injecting a couple thousand, which is probably trivial pocket change, but which kept uh, that project going during that, that season. Um, but it's now gone for 10 years, and this work focuses uh, in the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica, which is a beautiful area in terms of biodiversity. Um, and it's been uh, really a privilege to have uh, a lot of people, students, graduate students, postdocs, undergrads who have worked there. And so these are my graduate students, Claire and Elliot on either side, uh, Jacob Krieger and Louise Roberts, postdocs, and Louise uh, Leah Valdez, an undergraduate. And we're, we have multiple uh, new students, Nick, Megan, and Balt, who have also joined the lab. Though I like to um, think of the lab as more being represented by this, which was taken in the 1960s, and um, uh, Professor X in that picture. Um, and if you guys are uh, going to be at Behavior in Chicago, the Behavior 2019 conference, uh, you'll hear some much more updated talks on the system. We have six talks there, but I'm going to review some of the background um, on the system. And so uh, the main point is that in these hermit crabs, uh, they need to wait until shells degrade. So there's a lot of anecdotes that have been published in the past, uh, Hawaii News Bulletin type things about crabs yanking snails out of their shell and moving in, well, uh, we found in multiple experiments that they always need that gastropod to degrade naturally, all the flesh rots out, and then they can move into that shell. And what we've done in that study system in OSA is to basically become landlords of a vast array of beachfront property, which includes, uh, no joke, literally now tens of thousands of individually marked shells, RFID tags, Floy tags, and in the very early days, house paint. Um, and the central thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is that this is a very biodiverse housing market. So um, we've now inventoried all the different shell species that these crabs inhabit there. Uh, this work was done with um, Gary Verme, who's just a brilliant scientist. And incidentally, if you don't know, he's been blind from the age of four years. He's a MacArthur Genius Fellow and a uh, professor at UC Davis. And what he's known to do is to use his incredible sense of touch to differentiate shells, and he's often goes into museums and feels those shells and says, yeah, you got a couple of cryptic species here. And they're like, yeah, whatever, Verme. And then years later, they look carefully and he was actually correct. So in Osa, there's um, approximately 50 different shell species that they inhabit there. And for all of these shells, they do the following. And this is what is central to this talk is that they remodel these shells. So the crabs architecturally carve out the inside, eliminating the calcium carbonate matrix, 
And you can see the difference. I also want like Verme for you to feel the difference. So I'm going to pass around. I want to get them back. Uh, this is a unremodeled shell, and this is a matching diameter remodeled shell. And you can kind of compare the differences in those. And so uh, we're going to quantify the architecture of these shells. Admittedly, Lord Rutherford would tell us, uh, if your experiment needs statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. But Lord Rutherford was a <laughs> physicist, and we are biologists, so we will indeed use a little bit of statistics. And this is the basic roadmap. So I'd like to think first, what were the ultimate causes of this change in architecture? What both enabled and favored it? And what, and more critically, for the purposes of this talk, are the ultimate consequences of this architectural remodeling? How does that impact later generations? And then finally, mechanistically, how do they do that? And so I'm going to go through what we've discovered on that as well as um, a bit of work in progress. So the first thing that's kind of surprising when you look at these shells is that uh, these remodeled shells are actually substantially thinner in their walls. And that's a little bit surprising because for hermit crabs, the shell is their barrier and protection in the outside world. So why in the world would they thin it? Um, for a number of years, I had wondered this because I had seen no predation on the system in the wild. And that was despite uh, all night, um, night vision goggle watches, uh, putting out camera traps, um, all sorts of things. And I'd occasionally seen raccoons attempting to bite in these shells, but spitting them out. So at some point, I decided I needed a substitute predator. And uh, this is when I was at Berkeley. So I wandered over to the mechanical engineering department and asked them what they had. And they introduced me to the Instron 8871, a crushing machine. And uh, being a good biologist, I wanted to make sure that I made this ecologically valid. So I ordered a raccoon skull off eBay and hooked that up to the machine. And here you have it. This is the uh, lovely setup. It's a little loud, so just bear with me. And what that machine was programmed to do is to come down at a set speed and to break the shell. And it could tell us exactly how much force that took to open the shell. And so these are the results, which are not particularly surprising at start. So for these brand new shells, compared to the remodeled ones, is they take uh, substantially less force to crush. But what's most interesting about this is that red dotted line. And that red dotted line is the maximum calculated bite force of these local raccoons in that environment. And we've been able to track these shells across years, all of them. So we know from the starting cohort to after, and it seems that crabs remodel these shells to a threshold that remains out of reach of these local predators. Now, these are natural shells that we assume, and I'll show you evidence um, a few slides from now, that have probably lasted in the population for a decade, if not longer. And uh, you can see that these eventually do wear down to a point where they may come within reach of that predator. But for the most part, these are um, outside of that force. And what's interesting is when you compare the difference between the shell predators on land and sea is you find a substantial difference. So in the sea, for hundreds of millions of years, there have been specialists that are able to break into these shells. These include things like puffer fish, which look really cute but have vice-like jaws that are capable of breaking at five kilonewtons, stomatopods, which have one of the fastest movements in the animal kingdom and to smash shells, and brachyurin crabs. But on land, none of these creatures seem to have this force. So it seems that these animals got a free ride when they moved on to land. But I'd like to uh, point out that a free ride doesn't mean no predation pressures at all. And so uh, I'd like to just have a little side story, which is an important video, which field biologists often do techniques that work mindlessly all the time. And uh, one technique I use quite a lot is I breathe on crabs, terrestrial hermit crabs, which gets them out of their shell. So it works like this. Uh, if you take a crab, keeping it there, put your breath on it, a crab will come partway out of the shell. And if you're fast enough and you need to be fast, then you can basically grab the anterior appendages and wiggle out of the shell. Now, I've done that for many years, and I was sitting one time on the beach thinking to myself, like, why does this work so well? And what I realized is that there is kind of a neat study in that. And so I did a series of comparisons. I brushed my teeth, and that still works. <laughs> I had other people breathe on the crabs. That still works. You just need to be careful. But here's where it gets interesting, is among those shells, there's one shell that's the most fragile of all. It's called the... Um, apple snail shell, it's in the Pamacea genus, and crabs in that shell are the most responsive to breath. Uh, this wasn't easy to get to the field, but I tried a, a large set of different types of compressed air, and what I found is that the only thing that elicits this is pure CO2, which is on the exhaled breath of a mammal. And if you do exactly the same test to marine hermit crabs, you find that they're completely unresponsive. So it seems that these crabs on land, when they face, and they're in literally the, the grips of death, and the chance that that shell may break, then they come out of the shell and can pinch the lips of the predator and potentially stand a chance of getting away.
Okay, so this explains at least that predation is less on land. It still is there, but it's less on land. What favored this form of construction and remodeling? So one thing that's kind of interesting is when you weigh these shells, you find that they're about a third lighter on weight. And you could make a little adaptive story in your head that, boy, oh boy, they, that's great. You no longer have water buoyancy to support your shell, so now you remodel it on land. But we've put that to a much more rigorous test by uh, putting hermit crabs on a controlled treadmill with an oxygen chamber where we can actually measure uh, the cost of this. Um, and this is a nifty setup that Bob Full had. He runs the cyber department at Berkeley, and we could basically quantify these costs. And what you find is that in these remodeled shells, they save substantial costs in terms of locomotion. If you compare that to how far they travel in nature, this is something that is um, a deep, deep savings in terms of adaptive value. So what I really want to focus on this talk is not why they remodel, but what these consequences are. And the first thing I'd like to convince you is that these shells last. So uh, this is work that was done in Bermuda years ago. And humans in their infinite foresight uh, drove the gastropods there extinct. They overfished them. And for 200 years after that, uh, hermit crabs held on just fine. And what was found is that they would actually tap a, stockle, a fossil stockpile of shells that were literally in a calcium carbonate matrix that as hurricanes came through, they would dig out uh, and they continue to use these. And these shells are probably at least hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So these crabs use shells. They last a long time. And in our own population, we found that individually labeled shells have now lasted for a decade and counting. And so the interesting thing, if these shells are still around, is what are the consequences? And one thing that uh, might look somewhat trivial from the standpoint of the architecture, but turns out it has a big effect, is the opening size to these shells. And if you um, look at the one that's being passed around, you can compare that, and the opening size is about twice as big. And so you can do the following very simple experiment, is you can take a crab out of its original shell, which is always a remodeled shell in that population, and you can allocate them to either a conspecifics remodeled shell matching in overall diameter or an unremodeled shell. And what you find is very stark. Within 24 hours, those that are allocated to one of these unremodeled shells are dead. Uh, those that are allocated to a conspecific derived shell are just fine. And the reason is quite simple. They literally cannot squeeze into these unremodeled shells. They desiccate and die, and then ants go after their abdomen. Now, those are controlled experiments, but what's fascinating is to put this within the context of the entire housing market, which now, after a decade, I've pretty laboriously uh, measured. And what you see up here are a couple thousand of both unremodeled in red and remodeled shells. And these span the entire set of shell diameters all the way up to the very biggest in the population. And on the y-axis is the size of the opening in that shell. And what's kind of interesting is if you look at all the way the extreme here, which I'll sort of leap to, is at that size, the size of the opening is not even as big as the very smallest um, of these remodeled shells. And what that means from the perspective of a hermit crab is that as you're leaping up that blue sloped line and getting into bigger and bigger shells, you can only do that by getting those shells from conspecifics. No longer can you get them from the snails themselves. And that's why we think that these crabs have become boom, 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 much more social. And you can test that in a variety of experiments. Uh, a couple highly sophisticated techniques like taking a dowel with fishing line, tethering a bunch of crabs to it to create a simulated group. And what you find is that within a mere 10 minutes, crabs will flock to that site and accumulate there, thinking that this is some sort of mass shell exchange. You can do the same by creating a puppet show where a reliable field assistant has a long fishing line thread threaded into the forest, and they jostle those at controlled rates. And what you find is that the greater the level of collective commotion, which is indicative of the chance of eviction, the stronger the attraction to these sites. We've also more recently created a very clever wax museum where we can align these shells in sort of different social structures. And what we find is that the crabs are actually sensitive to the timing of this. So structures that are very close to the time of eviction when there wouldn't be a chance for them to immediately get into this group and be in the right spot at the right time. They avoid joining those, but they'll join the ones where they have a chance of being in line to receive one of these shells. Now these are all nice, but I'd like to put this into a deeper phylogenetic contrast and indeed do a much more rigorous test. And the reason for this is because uh, as Andrew Bork has pointed out, right now, relatively little is known about the pathways followed in the origin of social groups of unrelated individuals. And so what's very valuable is that for these hermit crabs is we have a nicely worked out phylogeny. This was worked out by Heather Brack and Grisham and colleagues. 
and buried within this phylogeny right around this spot are the terrestrial hermit crabs. And what's fascinating when this was worked out is that the very closest relative of these terrestrial hermit crabs, these marine hermit crabs that live in tide pools right in the same area that the terrestrial hermit crabs wander around. So here you have two species with nearly the same environments living in nearly the same place and close relatives. And uh, those were put to a controlled test. And so what I'm gonna show you is that data now. Um, and these are basically all three of those species. Uh, and here I'm calling them niche constructors, the ones that do that architectural remodeling and live in architecturally remodeled shells and those that don't. And what you find is that in those control groups with these very sophisticated setups of tethering, fishing line and dowels is you find no change in the control, but you find a really dramatic within 10 minutes attraction to these simulated groups among these architectural constructing species that flock there in the numbers of approximately 50 in that short period of time. We've now found that it's not just their attraction to living conspecifics, but they're also highly attracted to dead conspecifics. So this is work by Leah Valdez, who uh, remarkably published several first author papers as an undergrad and is now starting her PhD just next month at Cornell in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. And what we found is that by smushing crabs, another highly sophisticated setup, is that these crabs are specifically and only attracted to conspecifics. And that doesn't apply in these marine species. This is something that changed during that transition from sea to land. Uh, my graduate student, Elliot Steele, has also now analyzed in detail their visual constraints that they face. And these aren't just simple beach environments. There's a lot of fallen material, leaves, and other things. Um, and he's currently exploring how this impacts their ability to find these groups. Uh, one other dramatic change that this architectural remodeling has had is um, in a surprising area that I never thought I would actually work on is penis size. Um, and this all originated by visiting museums and actually starting to compare these different species. Um, and what I realized is that the species we study, Cenobita compressus, has an incredibly large relative to other closely related species sexual tube. And what we've done is we put that into a phylogenetic context and analyze that. And what you find is that only these species that do this architectural remodeling have this enlarged tube. And what we think is going on here is that in the midst of one of their most uh, risky endeavors, coming partway out of the shell to have sex and to copulate, is that shell can be stolen for them. And it would mean that within 24 hours, they would die and desiccate. And these tubes seem to be a morphological adaptation so that like barnacles, which are stuck in one spot and have elongated penises, they can basically save the day by not coming all the way out of the shell, but still copulate. So I'd like to focus on in the, the rest of the time is what goes on actually within these social groups. And so um, Tinbergen said that an animal is social and he has a very broad and simple definition. That an animal is called social when it strives to be in the neighborhood of fellow members of its species. And so what do these hermit crabs actually do? And uh, <laughs> as you might've gotten the point now, it's pretty nasty. It's not always uh, harmonious, harmonious things. And usually what is happening is this. And uh, within one of these chains of individuals, this one on the far end over here has been flipped over and is now being forcibly pulled out by the individual right behind it. When that happens, uh, this chain allows individuals to actually move up. And so what you see is this beautiful social coordination where a set of size match individuals will align and be able to move into those shells. And so what I'd like to walk through is a, is a very simple experiment that um, is satisfying after 10 years of watching this system where what we did was to ask how these architecturally remodeled shells, which we know have now lasted for a decade, impact later generations. And so the setup for this experiment was as follows. It was to take these two shell types, unremodeled and remodeled shells, and introduce them into the population. And fine-grained video was taken over these. And the question was how and whether these two shells would set off these types of vacancy chains, where one individual can move up, the next individual moves in that shell all the way down the line. And so I'm gonna show you a video in real time of this process actually happening. So this is not sped up. This is how quickly this operates in this population. And so first of all, just to orient you, so this is one of these lines. And this is uh, one of these introduced remodeled shells that is empty. This is a chain of individuals. And what I'd like you to focus your attention on is the individual who come from the top right corner and is gonna arrive just a little bit too late, okay? And so you'll see it assess the shell and now moves into the shell and now its old shell is a little bit broken. It has a hole, but it turns around to make the assessment of its old shell and see that it likes the new one. 
and then it moves away. And now what you're going to watch, now watch that individual coming from the top, comes a little bit too late, is this next one will move up into that. And with a very quick instance, this whole chain is set off. And so um, this is rather remarkable how speedily this process happens. And so what happens when you ultimately introduce these uh, paired remodel and unremodeled is you find a pretty profound impact. And this is on multiple dimensions, but the most simple one is how many other crabs in the population ultimately get a new shell to them. And that is seven times as many when one of these remodeled shells is vacated. So uh, the sociologist Ivan Chase uh, likes to think of this as a sort of shell game. <laughs> it happens in all sorts of things, including humans, when various things, cars are sold, apartments open up, all those sorts of things set off these same chains. Um, one of the things we're doing out on shoals right now that we think is kind of profound is to examine um, whether this impacts marine crabs. Now, marine crabs hate remodeled shells. If you try to force them into them, they don't like them. And it makes sense because they're trying to get the maximum predation they can, maximum protection from predation they can have in the marine environment. But one concern is that future ocean acidification may alter these properties in ways that are uh, actually mimicking what these terrestrial hermit crabs do. And so we're starting to explore how that may uh, change predator-prey relations. But back to these terrestrial hermit crabs, the other fascinating thing that we see in these populations is that individuals will actually team up. <laughs> the 99% will team up uh, to evict those individuals at the very top of the housing market. And so this ends up being a process where there's multiple decision points among the crabs. So crabs, number one, have to decide whether they're going to work together. And when these chains do form, individuals who arrive later need to make a decision of which chain they're going to join, where they have the highest chance of having a shell come down the line. So this is a real picture of what these actually look like. There's two crabs that have flipped an individual over and they both jointly work, both in sequence and rotating in time, pulling someone out. And so right now we're trying to model this uh, game theoretically with my mathematics collaborator, Fang Fu. He's in the mathematics department at Dartmouth. And I'm just gonna go through a very simple conceptual framework for how we think this operates and why it's actually quite interesting. So, from the starting point, you have a smaller individual wanting to move into a bigger individual shell. Well, that's tricky because usually a bigger individual is stronger, so it can't necessarily do that. The obvious thing that coalitions add is together, that may be possible. You can potentially successfully evict individuals when you have the right size. What we find the most profound is that this housing market situation where there are step functions to get up into bigger shells may eliminate the problem of splitting the spoils. And the logic is that individuals who are so small cannot just make a gigantic leap into a McMansion, so to speak, is that they need to actually wait to make the move to a intermediate sized cell. So that actually can align their evolutionary interests, allowing B to move into A's shell, C move in there, and yes, that's no good for A, but sometimes that's how it works in nature. And so again, with Fang, we're trying right now to formalize this in a game theoretic sense. Our ultimate goal is to make predictions about which coalition should form and be stable in nature. Now, these are not primate coalitions where Bob knows Charlie and they're operating as individuals. These are very much simple decision rules that we think can allow when one individual is starting to evict someone else, others can decide whether or not to join. And some empirical data that we're examining on this is both how they make these assessments. And we recently found, uh, this is with my postdoc, Louise Roberts, that basically individuals that are weaker, and we can simulate this by vibrational little coin motors inside shells, individuals that are weaker are more likely to have their shell attempted to be flipped over. And so it seems individuals are constantly going around and making these assessments of other individuals in the population. What is the real game changer is a machine that's quite simple for him, but I was so happy when it was made, uh, that my collaborator, Doug Van Sitters, who's a professor in the School of Engineering has built, which is our eviction machine. And right now uh, that allows us to actually quantify the force it takes to pull out different individuals from their shell. And all it is is a very simple load cell that allows us to quantify both their resistance force as well as separately the maximum amount that they could pull to try to evict someone else. So this is, I think, a major direction right now where we're going is we want to make these quantified numbers across the housing market and start to pair that with these predictions about how these coalitions form or don't form in certain situations. So when I first started studying the system, and I'll tell you, I really did think this was going to be completely a one-off two month side project where I was at the time studying threat displays and was curious to see how terrestrial hermit crabs compared to their marine relatives. And what I was surprised when I first got down there in 2008 is they didn't display at all. So I was actually very sad that 
this was a system where I thought I can't look at the evolution of signals, which was my central interest at the time. Um, luckily, we've actually found some cool stuff that these guys do. Number one I'd like to point out is that they have lost the ability to display. So my graduate student Claire Doherty has right now created these very clever models of hermit crabs and we've been able to create moving models to ask how terrestrial hermit crabs respond to the ghosts of threats past. And it turns out that they don't care anymore. Not only do they not produce these displays, when we reanimate them, they're completely irrelevant. And what we think is that these shells have become so valuable in their remodeled form that threat displays can't even function in this type of environment because the cost benefit trade-off is so flipped to favor going and assessing someone to know if you can kick them out of that shell. But what's fascinating is that these animals do actually make some form of what we think, and this is work in progress, maybe signals. And so pet owners of these terrestrial crabs frequently have recorded this. You can play that if you want to. I'm just gonna make the sound so you can hear it, but they make a kind of croaking, chirping sound where they go, eh, eh, eh inside of their shell. And they do that in these contexts where there's a battle over shells. And so when I was in Berkeley, I had wanted something that was a glass shell so I could see inside the shell and know how they were producing this. So I walked down Telegraph Avenue where there were lots of glass blowers. And although they made many things, uh, none of them were willing to make me glass shells. Uh, but lo and behold, when I moved to Dartmouth just an hour away was this gentleman, Robert Dugrenier, who for decades has been blowing glass shells. And so Right now we have a collaboration, which has now been going on for five years, where we're trying to perfect these shells to the point that they actually mimic the real architecture of the remodeled ones so we can see inside and watch what they're doing. The main point of all this is ultimately so we can examine how they're making the sound. And what we've been using to do that is a laser vibrometer, which we can shine both on natural shells and on these glass shells and examine what the actual vibration and acoustics that they make. Now here is what we're trying to test right now. And this is work um, in collaboration with Beth Mortimer, who's at Oxford and who I was just visiting uh, just last week and who fortuitously I met when I was giving a talk there in March and that's when this collaboration emerged. And so what you can think about is when these vacancy chains form, sometimes not all of the crabs that are of the necessary size are there. Sometimes there's gaps. And what that means for smaller size individuals is there's a danger because they can't necessarily make the leap into the next size shell up. And what we find is that in many circumstances, these crabs are the ones that will make this chirping. And so what we're trying to test right now is basically whether the shell itself, and this is a testable hypothesis, so it may be true, may be false, we'll find out, has different resonant properties that could be conveyed to other individuals and in effect attract the right size individuals to this resource. And so that's something that we're trying to perfect both the recordings of these actual sounds and then ultimately, which is uh, very painstaking, the appropriate playbacks, which is not easy because these crabs may be perceiving this through substrate borne vibrations. Uh, the other area where we're very interested to explore is thinking about uh, the brains of these crabs. Now, this is an area that I have uh, probably zero expertise, um, but uh, with Stefan Harsh, who I was visiting uh, earlier this month, uh, who visited me in Dartmouth a couple years back, is we've started now to basically image these brains. And uh, Stefan is an expert on invertebrates, nervous systems, neurophylogeny, and we're trying to compare each of these different species that have these more complicated social lives with ones that don't. And the question is whether or not there's any relationship in the amount of architectural remodeling and construction that goes on in them versus not. Finally, one more area that we're excited to explore is, and these are indicated with very uh, inept PowerPoint icons, but if you think about all of the species of shells those terrestrial hermit crabs inhabit, is there's uh, darn well hundreds of these out there. And what's fascinating is that when these crabs remodel these shells, they seem to change what is to begin with a very different architecture of all these starting point shells into a singular architecture that now with CT scans, we can actually look at the endocast. And something we're very curious about is whether the vast difference that we see in the number of marine hermit crabs, close to 800 versus the number of terrestrial hermit crabs has something to do with this changed architecture actually constraining the prospect for adaptive radiation. So if you look along the entire Pacific coast, what you find is that there's only one species of terrestrial hermit crab, despite there being hundreds all along that link that inhabit the same original shells that are unremodeled. And when these crabs change them, they're ultimately eliminating that niche diversity. So we think there might be something going on that can constrain uh, the prospects for speciation.
Finally, we're still trying to figure out how they mechanistically do this. We've taken scanning electron microscopy of these shells. There's a very old paper in the 80s that found that hermit crabs, terrestrial hermit crabs in particular, have high levels of uric acid. We thought that was a prospective candidate for how they remodeled. We've now bathed these shells in uric acid, and that's not strong enough. And what the critical question is, because these crabs cannot scrape away those shells in the time with which they do it, there has to be some chemical component. And so we're still trying to solve the mystery of how they remodel a shell without dissolving their own exoskeleton that is made with calcium carbonate as well. Um, and this is something that if other people who are experts on a mechanistic level are interested, uh, we'd, love, we'd love to explore collaborations on that. So I'd like to just recap the basic themes of this, which is that when these individuals, uh, these crabs moved onto land, they encountered relaxed predation. And with that relaxed predation, they seem to have been able to get away with remodeling their shells. And this favors uh, their adaptive value of now having lower locomotion costs. But what's much more interesting is that the ultimate consequences of creating this remodeled housing market is that it's changed the course of social evolution for these crabs. It's set off resource cascades. It's favored individuals to form coalitions. It's created new novel acoustic and vibrational signals that we don't see in marine hermit crabs. It may have changed their brains. We'll find out it definitely has changed their penises. And it may have also altered the course of their prospects for adaptive radiation. I've tried to focus in this talk on this singular system because I am a strong believer and I've done this in my mandrel work. I've done this in any other empirical system I've studied is to spend the years it takes to actually study the animal in nature and know what it's doing. But I do think that the themes in this system apply much more broadly. And if you think about the architectural foundations that exist of social evolution, many creatures, what they build and what they create sets the stage for the types of interactions they have and the prospects for them to actually have groups. And so this is a central theme that I'm now trying to review. I'm not the expert across all of these systems. I'd love to talk to people who think about some of these, but certainly in social insects, these nests that they build seem to be the fortresses that are ultimately central to a lot of the evolution of eusociality. One theme that we're now trying to explore in the hermit crabs, which is kind of a phase shift from just looking at behavior, is to now begin to take genetic samples, microsatellites from individuals across the housing market. So this last season uh, with my student, Nick, we've now taken over 2,000 separate microsatellites across this housing market. And our goal is ultimately to trace the course with which individuals move over time and how these are coordinated sequences that if you think about it, is ultimately a multi-layer social network. So one of our long-term goals in the system is to pair that genetic data with, of individuals with the individually marked shells and look at how these pathways through the housing market are had. And that comes both through specific shell associations that need to be together in space and time for someone to leap between them as well as particular individual associations that are the coalitions and other forms of gatherings that we see in nature. Finally, since we're here at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior, I had to end with a little quote by Ian Cousin, who among many papers, uh, I really liked this quote, which Ian pointed out that the social aspects of migration have to date received very limited attention. And so I'd just like to end with a video, uh, which luckily EDU Rome is working, so I can actually play that. Um, which is of hermit crabs, and this is not the species we study, this is a species in the Caribbean that migrates from sea to land. And um, we just started to work on the island of St. John last year, and this is where these migrations happen, and I'm just gonna show you a clip of this, and we think it's a system that's very ripe for future exploration down the road. And basically these animals live up in the mountains, and every year, once a year, they come all the way down to the sea to release their eggs. And this kind of looks like chaos, um, but they all do it in one large collective. And there's a lot of experiments that one could imagine doing to actually tease that system apart and examine the physiological costs and to ultimately explore all the aspects that are the collective elements of that. Um, and so that's kind of exciting. I'd like to just thank uh, many people, including Ian, who were important mentors and collaborators in my life. And perhaps most importantly, I'd like to uh, thank this gentleman uh, Henry Horn, who very sadly uh, passed away last year. He was my PhD advisor, and not everybody loves their PhD advisors, I get it, but I love this man. Uh, he was one of the most creative, uh, kind, wonderful humans that's ever walked this earth, and I think <laughs> we are actually uh, very much less uh, to not have him around anymore. But I think um, the knowledge that he generated, both in thinking about trees and thinking about, and there's a book that finally is published that was one of his other culminations on social butterflies, uh, we were very lucky to have him around as long as we did. Um, so 
Uh, I'd like to just end this talk by saying it's, it's really cool to be here again where there's so many people who study animal behavior. I will be around here like all tomorrow and I don't have any <laughs> explicit meetings set up, but I'd love to just hear about the things that people are doing here, chat with people and talk about any prospects for collaborations on the system, which I think there could be uh, many. And uh, thank you to Ian for uh, allowing this talk to happen. It's great to, it's great to visit. Thank you very much. Thank you.